Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Q Code Podcast. Travis, Danny, and not Alan today. Uh, he is feeling a little under the weather, so we're like three or four episodes into this thing, and already we've lost we're losing one. people. Um, but they're dropping like flies. Do not fear. Because when one Barnes is down, another one will come right in and <laughs> fill the spot. <laughs> so we have uh, the the sister of the Barnes family, Tracy. How you doing? Good. Thanks for inviting me on. I think you guys will be really surprised and happy with how I do today oh. instead of Alan. Okay. <laughs> so really, I think what Tracy's saying is that she's try- <clears throat> excuse me, trying to take his place. <laughs> Um, so Alan, if you're listening to this and we get Which he lots probably of good is feedback. listening to this because he's pretty much on the other <laughs> side of the wall here. <laughs> we record in his house and in his garage. So, so it's uh, almost like he's here with us right <laughs> he now. He is here. He's just probably passed out in the other room. So, but uh, we have a good show today. But before we get into that, we always like to uh, just discuss something random that's that's gone on in our week and uh dan you said you had something that was very important well i don't know how important (laughs) it was but i do have an experience that i had uh at the gas station the other day so this is kind of a weird one and actually it's funny because i thought about this would actually be an interesting thing to maybe bring tracy in on sometime because i think that she actually could try to assess or analyze this. So for anyone who doesn't know, my sister Tracy, who's on the podcast with us today, is a psychologist. Is that correct, Tracy? Yeah, but uh, anything I say does not accurately reflect my skills. Okay. (laughs) I'm just scared of what you're going to have me analyze. (laughs) Well, you have no... Yeah. We we plan to bring you on various times to uh, analyze... Many different things, mostly Danny's dreams. So, um, which we've we've had a few of those already, and uh, you can tell how crazy those are. But uh, but what do you? Ha- <laughs> so, what was your experience? So, I went to the gas station the other day on my way to work, and I went and pumped some gas. When I was pumping gas, I walk inside and I go grab a drink. While I get my drink and I come back into the line. There's a gas station attendant that I've seen there before because it's kind of my morning ritual. I'll stop at the gas station probably like two or three times a week. So I kind of get to know some of the gas station attendants. So I go in there and I'm taking my drinks up to go pay for them. Well, there's a guy in front of me and he's literally got a Red Bull and a donut that he's kind of literally, he's already eating the donut. But he tells the guy, he hands him a $100 bill and he says, all right. I just want to, I want 50 back and then I want the balance on in gas on pump 10. The guy looked at him and he's like, wait, what? Fine. Cause I mean, the way he explained it, I agree is like, not like super clear. Right. But he's like, so he explains it again. He's like, I just want $50 back and then I want to buy these and the balance in gas. So mm-hmm. what he's saying is, Hey, I want fifty dollars in change, and then out of the other fifty, you pay for my, my donut, gas, my donut, and my, my drink, bowl. and then whatever's left, put that much in gas on the pump, right? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Well, the dude <laughs> could not comprehend this. Like he's like start. He's like kind of. He's like laughing, and he's like as if like this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and he's like, okay, man, listen. You, why do you keep saying 50? This is a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> and the guy's like, I know. He's like, literally, like, what do you want me to do? Cut this in half? And then you would have two parts of a hundred dollar bill. And he's like, no, there's like, there's two fifties in there. And he's like, no, <laughs> this is a hundred dollar bill. And then I'm like, okay, I better step in here and try and help explain this. So I try to explain to the gas station attendant, like, okay, what he wants is fifty dollars cash. That'll like, leave him fifty. Hold, hold on, sir. I'm really good with math. I'm Asian, so <laughs> let me help out. <laughs> 
He should just believe whatever the Asian says. So, yeah, he goes in and... um, (laughs) So I try to explain it again the same way. I mean, but like with different words, right? So basically I explain the same thing. Like, okay, I think he wants $50 in cash back. So like he'll want a $50 bill back. He's like, I don't have a $50 bill. It's early in the morning. I'm like, okay. I'm like, do you have 20s? It's like, <laughs> it's too early. I don't have any change. And I'm like, is this what, what's catching him? Like, is this where he's getting caught up on it or something? Do you like guys that? not get like a till or something that you have to use? I mean, that you turn in at the end of the night. The, then when you come in in the morning, you pick up that till that has change in it. <laughs> like, you just are just hoping that everybody is giving you exact change for the first little bit of your morning until <laughs> you, you accrue enough. So... That's, I know, I agree with that, but I'm like, okay, like, I, fine, whatever. Maybe they just only have like a few $5 bills or something in there because it's early and they just get to start with a certain amount. What gas station was this? This is the stop on the way, like, just right off Highway 89. Okay. Okay. So, anyway, I'm trying to explain this, but I'm like, okay, he's not getting it. So, he's still, he's just totally caught up on this, like, this is a $100 bill. Why do you keep talking about 50s? I don't have fifties. Like if you give me a 50, then I can do what you're saying. And I'm like, that is literally two fifties in the hundred dollar (laughs) bill. And then I'm like, okay, let me try this a different way. I'm like, do you have four twenties and two tens in your till? Cause then we can make $50 out of that. Right. (laughs) And he's like, I don't have any change, man. Like it's too early in the morning. And so I start looking in my wallet, literally seeing if I can break a hundred dollar (laughs) bill to make this transaction easier. But I didn't have enough money to break a hundred dollar bill in my wallet. And so I'm like, okay, let's do this. I'm like, how much does his donut and his drink cost together? And he's like, but he wants gas. And I'm like, I know. We're going to take this one step at a time. <laughs> what would he How have much? done if he just wanted the donut and drink? Would this guy have not gotten change back? I don't. Well, this is where it'll get there. <laughs> so he gets, I'm like, how much is ring up? That's just the donut and the drink. And he does that. And then he's like, it's $3 and 87 cents. I'm like, okay, now put in $46 and 13 cents for gas. And he like is like, what? And then he goes off on this thing about like, okay, you're not getting this, man. Like, I, I get what you're saying. You're doing this math stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're doing this, mind, this Jedi mind trick right now. <laughs> <laughs> but for whatever reason, like, he goes off on this tirade about how he, he understands that, but he's a human and he's working with a machine and the humans and the machines have to work together and they don't understand. The machine doesn't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and I'm like, the machine doesn't need to understand what I'm saying. You just need to put in $46 and 13 cents in gas and press enter. And finally it's like, fine, we'll, whatever. We'll see what happens. And so he does it. <laughs> it's, it's a mystery. <laughs> he does it. And it's like total $50. Like, Oh, well, there's that 50. (laughs) (laughs) And so then he like opens, like he's like, does it. And then he opens up his till. He's got like $300 in twenties, like a hundred dollars in tens. Like his till is totally full of cash. And he just gives the guy $50 change. And so I'm like, what the heck was this kid's problem? (laughs) I don't know. I'm ready with my diagnosis. So, (laughs) so, Then the guy leaves. He finally walks out. Because, oh, well, I mean, it's a moot point at this point. But the dude literally gave up on trying to explain it to him after the first minute or so. So he, like, turns to me once I, like, started trying to help him. And he's like, you take care of it, man. <laughs> and, like, he just stood on the side eating his donut and drinking his drink <laughs> the whole time. So now I'm, like, dealing with his transaction. So anyway, finally, he, like, walks out to go pump his gas or whatever. And then I go to pay for my drink and the gas station attendant's like man do you see what i'm saying made no sense whatsoever (laughs) so i'm trying to play sympathetic with him like yeah he kind of explained it weird like i work with money all the time i work in banking so that's why i was able to deduce like that (laughs) formula that's why i was able to do simple math (laughs) simple addition and subtraction and so we do that and then i pay for my thing i walk out 
And then the dude out there is pumping his gas and he looks at me he's like, dude, man, what was up with that? And I'm like, yeah, I have no idea, man. That's crazy. <laughs> so I'm like trying to sympathize with both sides. But as I got in the car and this, and then we'll let Tracy kind of bring in her diagnosis. But as I got in the car, I was like, you know what? Like, Honestly, I kind of I I don't understand how he didn't get it fully cuz it's not that hard or difficult to understand for me. But sometimes if you just don't know what you don't you just don't know what you don't know, right? So literally to him for whatever reason, this whole thing became this completely foreign concept to him and he just didn't know he couldn't comprehend that how to deal with fifties in his mind when he's holding a hundred dollar bill. But what do you think, Tracy? Like, what would you say? Before is your Tracy diagnosis? says anything, this is my diagnosis. Dumbassery. <laughs> 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 well, that was harsh. Yes. <laughs> he's not listening to this. <laughs> I would diagnose something along the lines of a stimulant use disorder. Do I need to clarify <laughs> yes. what yes. that is? That would be somebody who uses something along the lines of cocaine. Ah. Mm -hmm. Ah. Yeah. No. (laughs) I'm not. I'm talking normal. Danny is, uh, just so everybody knows, he likes to try and you know, use sign language, which it's pointless. You should just probably just say it in the mic because then we all just stop and we stare at you. (laughs) So it's true. I am talking at a normal decibel. So I'm trying to play producer today because our (laughs) producer is out. And for whatever reason, I'm just going to come out clean with it. Trav, you're when you're talking, it's clipping. So try and maybe just come back from the mic a little bit is what I'm trying to say. No, <laughs> I will talk how I always okay. talk, <laughs> which is fine, but then no one will understand what you're saying. On That's okay. Okay. But yeah, so that was my story and you think he's on cocaine. <laughs> that's, that's the gist of it. I just can't uh, myself comprehend somebody not being able to split a hundred into two halves. And how old was he? Um, I mean, my guess is like 30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Poor, poor gentleman. Yeah. I mean, we, we could do an IQ test and figure out if his cognitive abilities are impaired, but. All right. Well, let's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Should I not? <laughs> let's get right into it. Um, since we have three questions that we need to get to for today and, uh, we are starting with is it yours today daniel yep tornadoes tornadoes so just to get started here we got a little something little you're upset you you just gotta breathe you both just gotta breathe oh. Oh. So any of you guys who are <laughs> <Sweet> like, <clip. laughs> what's that? <laughs> that was a sweet clip. <laughs> if for any of you guys who uh, may be younger than, how when did that movie come out? It was like in the 90s. I know that much. But if you're younger than probably 25, then there's a good chance that you either, you have no idea what that movie was. But that was a cool movie when we were growing up called Twister. 1996. 1996. So that was 23 years ago. So yeah, if you're like 25, you'd only have been two when that came out. <laughs> you are good at math. You know, <laughs> I should be working at a gas station. You <laughs> set, your, set the bar high, Daniel. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, my question this week uh, stems from how often do F5 tornadoes occur? And knowing that... Um, I don't know. I mean, the reason I even, I couldn't even remember for a minute why I came up with this question, but then I remembered, I listened to this book, um, on, I call it book on tape, but they're no longer on tape. (laughs) Just aging yourself more and more. You guys ever seen a movie back in 1996? 
I, I pulled out <laughs> my cassette my, tape. My cassette tape. Listen to book on tape. <laughs> like it was like even eight, after that was eight. book on CD. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <So>. true. <laughs> but no one ever called them book on CDs. If you think about it, like did anyone be like, well, I'm gonna listen to a book on CD? They always even called it book on tape. Still, just they? FYI. Oh, okay, just saying. <laughs> But anyway, um, yeah, so we listened to the audiobook um, by Michael Lewis called The Coming Storm. It, if anyone's interested in this kind of thing, it might be a fine listen, but even me, somebody who loves numbers and data, it wasn't the easiest thing to listen to because it's basically based around data, but he explains data using uh, storms and tornadoes as like the catalyst for the data. So that's kind of what made me think about it in the first place. And then I was like, yeah, I wonder how often these huge storms or these huge tornadoes occur. So that's what got me to think about this question. So in moving into this originally, do you guys know how a tornado even forms? Wind goes in circles. And (laughs) really, there's probably some water really fast. Probably. I think there's just some dark clouds start forming. Um, (laughs) And then, yep, just gets real, real windy. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. But so what happens originally is the sun beats down on the earth and warms up the earth. And then there's a warm pocket that's created and that warm pocket starts rising because heat rises, right? That then turns into a cumulus cloud and that's your normal just clouds that you typically see in the sky, your little puffy white clouds that mm-hmm. just float around. Well, norm, like uh, normally that could just be all that happens. But if there's a situation where they call the atmosphere is unstable, um, from my understanding, I think that just means that there's like there's cold air coming down from the, for example, in the from like Canada or something. But the warm air is still trying to rise from the ground because it's hot or warm. And then that keeps the process going longer than it typically would. And if that happens, it builds up higher and higher and higher. So now you get a really tall, you know, the storm clouds, the cumulonimbus clouds, those like dark, super tall clouds, Mm -hmm. right? Cumulonimbus. Yeah. So once you get to that point, that's still, I mean, that's just a thundercloud. That doesn't really cause a tornado. But if there's cold air coming in because of the uh, instability there's cold air coming in and it wants to sink and go and then the warm air wants to rise. So you get this weird circular motion that starts to happen inside the clouds. So the cold air pushes down, it warms up, it starts going back up and it keeps doing that and it goes over and over until now you literally have a rolling pin type of funnel wind system going on inside the cloud. So then you got that going. Well, that's still not enough to create a tornado. So once you get that going, now if there's still enough of that heat rising from the ground on one part of the cloud, that starts pushing up on one side of that horizontal rolling pin of wind, then it slowly can turn <laughs> vertical. I did a science project on tornadoes once, and I put two two-liter bottles together mm-hmm. and just put water in it. And uh, yeah, when you twirl them around, it does a tornado. And uh, that was all I knew. People would stop by and be like, well, how does this happen? I have no clue. (laughs) You just swirl it around. It makes a tornado. What more do you want to know? That's probably what's happening in real life, Trav. I'm sure there's somebody up there just spinning around a couple two-liter bottles, and then it makes a tornado, and then they're like, hey, my name is... (laughs) Are you going (laughs) to... Did you you not know where to go with that? (laughs) <laughs> well, I was gonna, I was gonna say God, but I don't want to be like sacrilegious either. Because hey, I mean, hey, my name is God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so once you get that going, so now you literally have a vertical column that's spinning, right? And then if you get enough cold air above that, that can literally push that down until it touches the ground. That is when you get a tornado. So you have to have all these things occur to create an actual tornado. So for every single thunderstorm that's out there, every single thunderstorm cloud that's out there, there's only like one of one in like 10,000 will actually become what they call a supercell. And a supercell uh, cloud is just, it's the 
it's the huge storms that end up with this kind of rolling air system going on. And then one in 10 supercell clouds actually create a tornado. Hmm. So really only like one in a hundred thousand thunderstorms will actually create a tornado. So it's, it's one of those things that you would think, I don't know, just looking at the Midwest, you're like, they have them all the time, but it's actually one of those, it, it's, it's difficult to get the situation to all come together to create a tornado. Hmm. And then on top of that, to have a large tornado takes, all, you know, the most tornadoes are the smaller tornadoes that don't cause like a ton of damage. Maybe they rip a few shingles off your roof or something like that. But for the most part, the, to get the huge ones, that's like 1% of all tornadoes. And what is considered the huge ones? the f5s and the f4s okay so that would bring me to my next question and that is do you guys know what the f stands for or why it's called why they have a scale called f1 f2 f3 (laughs) i have a an idea but it is not correct (laughs) (laughs) it's like just basically how many times i say the f-bomb when I see one. <laughs> fa, 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 fa. <laughs> I ended up watching a couple of documentaries on YouTube about tornadoes. Like, especially like I, they were specifically focused on like a couple of the larger um, tornadoes that have occurred. And I agree, like freak. I mean, I, from watching Twister, you're like, yeah, this is scary. But actually watching it in real life, I'm like, it's even scarier than it is on Twister. Because in a way, in Twister, it projects them to be almost like, okay, as long as I stay away from the actual funnel, I'm fine, Mm -hmm. right? But no. Like, there's the actual funnel, but then there's a huge radius around that funnel that can still, like, screw you over that super high winds and then not only that they have like little tail other tornadoes that are kind of coming off the main funnel that are spinning around the main funnel that can also cause damage and and suck you up or do whatever so really you can't even be like close to it you have to be like pretty far off no yeah i wouldn't want that would make sense to me (laughs) i would not want to be anywhere near them in fact, we had, uh, and maybe you're going to talk about this, I don't, I don't know, but here we obviously don't get too many tornadoes in Utah, um, but we did get one. When was this? It was, it was, like, in, it was 1999. The 90s. 99, yeah. right? And when that happened, I was actually, because you know when it ex- exactly, like what month it happened at all? Uh, it was in the summer. I think it was like in August or something. Oh, okay. Because all I remember is I was away on my family vacation in Island Park, Idaho, in a cabin. And I just remember watching it on TV. And I'm like, man, the one time that there's a tornado, I'm nowhere near it. Like, I was kind of like bummed. But then, now that I'm older and smarter, I don't want to be anywhere near any <laughs> tornadoes <laughs> whatsoever. But and I actually looked it up because I did remember that tornado, and I wanted to know like what it was rated, and it was rated an F two. Yeah, so it actually was fairly low on the scale. And but I remember thinking when I was a kid, I was like, "We had this massive tornado <laughs> in downtown Salt Lake," and it is massive for us who don't experience tornadoes very often. But as far as tornadoes could be, like as big as they could be, it was. A, Smaller one, I guess, you know. So. Yeah, well, the one that uh, one that happened before that was in, like, 1884. So, yeah, we do not get them very often at all. Yeah. So, and that's, I mean, that's partially just due to the, where we are and the fact that we have mountains and stuff like that. But it, even if they can create or if they can occur here in Salt Lake City, then that just tells you that they could occur, occur anywhere. Mm -hmm. So you're not safe necessarily anywhere, but you are safe, safer in the fact that if you're not in a place, especially what they call tornado alley, which is in essence, the Midwest in the United States of America. So, uh, but to go into the F scale really quick. So this is what like the whole point of my question was to begin with, but the F scale stands for Fujita scale. So it was created originally by a guy named Tetsuya. Fujita. 
Oh. Gotta love the Japanese. You know. I was proud as soon as I saw that. <laughs> just like, yeah, just he could be an ancestor of mine. And, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he came up with it in 1971. Um, he created that scale because there really wasn't a good scale. The scale they were using before that was called the Beaufort scale, which was literally measuring like tornadoes based on like how much dust and dirt they kicked up. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't like, let, I'll put it this way. The Fujita scale is super subjective anyway, but a scale like that would be even more subjective. Like, look at all that dust. It's like, <laughs> if it just happened to be like a dry, sandy climate, you're just like, this is huge. <laughs> <laughs> so this is much, ginormous. So much dust right now. And there could be a tornado that's like massive that just happens to be over water. And they're like, it's nothing. It's teeny. Yeah. Did you see that boat just get sucked up? doesn't matter. There's no dust. <laughs> Can turn tornadoes occur on water like that? Yeah. Oh. There's a name for them, too. Cyclones? Oh, oh. yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, <they're- laughs> hey, it sounded good. <laughs> there is one. I mean, in the movie Twister, actually, that scene that we just played earlier was tornadoes occurring over water. So. All right. And there were cows. Well, yeah, that was. They had been sucked up earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was the same cow. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the cow in the movie, just by the way, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> cow looks total nonchalant, just like whatever. <laughs> well, I'm just sort of <laughs> it flying around I in mean, a circle there. I don't know how to tell really, like the emotions of a cow per se, but it does. It's just like. <laughs> well, I just tell you, like if. I was an animal. I don't care if I was an animal or whatever, and I got sucked up. I'd just be flinging around like nobody's business, just being like, yeah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> just let me out of here! And the, the, the cow didn't care. He was probably fun. <laughs> <laughs> My whole life, I've just been grazing and standing in this field. Finally something exciting This is the happened. first time I've been out of this perimeter. I don't know why the cow was like Eeyore all of a sudden, but <laughs> he is. <laughs> anyway, so they have this Vegeta scale, but it, like I said, it's super subjective um, because it's based on the fact that it's just how much damage has occurred and not anything else, really. So they're basing the damage on like what they suspect. Like, okay, it would probably take winds of like an excess of 150 miles per hour to create this much damage. So then that's kind of what they're doing afterwards. But they don't actually ever raid a tornado until after it's done. Because I always thought like on the news, they're like, we got ourselves a F4 tornado like coming through this town or whatever. But that's just the news anchor or whoever it is that's talking that's just making his best guess but they could come out later and say like meteorologists yeah (laughs) they could come out later and just be like it's gonna rain no probably i just looked out the window it's not it's not gonna rain (laughs) should have looked out the window before you uh said that but yeah so in so but what they do is like and it only it can only be the national weather service that comes out and has to assess this. So they have to fly them in and they have to go out like the next day and be like, well, in looking at this, I would suspect that it was an F3 at looking at the damage that it caused. But again, it's just super subjective. <laughs> they have to make those, <laughs> those news anchors like go back in and, and apologize for calling it an F4 when in re- <laughs> reality it was an F3. Fake news. <laughs> You overestimated, but it it could be subjective literally on the fact that like, if you have a guy who's like newer, maybe he's only worked one or two cases or something for the national weather service. And he comes out, he doesn't really have that much to go on as far as somebody who maybe has been doing it for 20 years. It's like, I've seen a lot of damaged areas from tornadoes. So he has a better idea of how to assess like how bad it was. I've basically been doing this since Fujita made it. (laughs) made his scale i was there when fujita made the scale i am fujita but long story short and this probably most people know really quick the fujita scale goes from zero to five so you can go from zero one two three four five but originally (laughs) thank you 
I was, <laughs> yeah. I was a little worried that I didn't know well, what was in between and, zero and five. <laughs> and Dad, I have a question. Our yeah. outline here for the podcast says a crash course on everything tornado. And I feel like this is not a crash course. <laughs> These are his... His you questions are literally are breaking down the five point <laughs> scale to us. <laughs> this is a crash course for what I usually do. But anyway, the original scale actually went up to 12. But Fujita, Tetsuya Fujita himself said, an F12, anything above an F5 is impossible. There's just like nothing on earth will be able to create that, that much wind. So. Because he said if it was an F-12, the wind speeds would be around 741 miles per hour, which is insane hmm. for anyone who doesn't really have, like, that's, like, faster than the speed of sound. Oh. So, but the F-5 scale uh, is able to measure as high as, like, I mean, the in an F-5 tornado, that's the highest wind speeds there are on anything on Earth. That's faster than any hurricane. That's faster than any other place. The jet stream, um, there's no other winds on Earth that are faster than what occurs inside of an F-5 tornado. Okay. Just thought you'd like to know that. I did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're the expert, Danny, do you remember what the Joplin tornado was rated? Is that... Joplin, Missouri. Yeah, was what year was that? Like eight or nine years ago, I think. I think the Joplin one might have been an F five. It was an F five. <laughs> yeah. Did knowing the year help you understand what? Well, because <laughs> it's, it's just like how what year was that? I think it was eight or nine years ago. Then that would have been an F five tornado. <laughs> yeah, so, so, if you just give me the year, I give you the rating. Which Joplin tornado? <laughs> <laughs> well, so are you saying the rating comes from damage as far as the dollar damage or like the width of the path? Uh, so basically the Fujita scale originally was like, okay, if you kind of see X amount of damage occurred, like basically like if you take it like from a, a house, right? If it just rips off the shingles of the house, it's probably like an F1. If it does significant jam damage to the roof, it's like an F2. If the entire roof is ripped off and there's some structural damage, it's like an F3. If the entire building is basically like knocked over, then it's an F4. And if the entire house is just gone, ripped off its foundation, then it's an F5. But that's where it just kind of, it's, it's hard because it's subjective because different things get hit differently slightly, you know, like it's not just like, consistent throughout mm -hmm. so they came up with the ef scale which is what they use now and this is recent i think it's like 2007 when they came up with this so it's just basically it's called the enhanced vegeta scale mm -hmm. and it just is like more details on what to look for so it may go into more things like hey look and see like what damage happened to cars like how far did it throw a car and I watched, I think it was one of the documentaries I watched and they were explaining it too. And they were, it kind of was funny because like, well, if your car is thrown at least a hundred yards, then it's an F5. And then they're like showing two cartoon characters, like measuring and they're like, it's a hundred and two yards. So it's definitely an F5. But they're like, well, it landed on a hill and rolled down. So maybe it didn't really go a hundred and two yards in the air. Well, then it's an F4. <laughs> So, I mean, it's still subjective and that's the problem with it, but there's just no way to really measure things safely or that we have equipment that can just like handle those wind speeds right now that they can just measure the inside speeds of, of the tornado mm -hmm. as it's going. So that's kind of why they have it the way they have it. But back to the main question, how often do F5 tornadoes occur? And the answer, drum roll, please, Trav. <laughs> 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 is since 1950, there have been 59 F5 tornadoes. So not in the very, U.S.? In the U.S., yes. Thank you for clarifying that, Trey. Absolutely. So that's what we brought you here for. <laughs> Help clarify some stuff. <laughs> well, it's hard. When you got all these notes, you know, you miss things. But Gotta yeah, take since, my advice, less notes. <laughs> <laughs> but that equates to points, 0.86 F5s per year, which is less than one per year. But the thing is, like, they actually 
don't occur. So I looked at the list, like the full list of F5 tornadoes, and they're kind of clustered. So if you look at the list, it's not necessarily like there's like one almost every year or something like that. But instead, it's there's kind of clusters of them. So like in 1953, there was five different F5 tornadoes. And then there's two in 1955. And then if you go up, I mean, there's one-offs here and there. Like there's a one-off in 1956. But as you go up, like in 1966, there was three. 1968, there was four. And then the big one was 1974, there was seven. Dang. Um, And then in 2011, there was six. And so... That's Joplin year. Is that Joplin 2011? Yep. Yep, Joplin, Missouri, 2011, F5. So it's interesting because then because they do this, so I found out, I also learned, it was kind of interesting that they have something called um, super outbreaks. And so there's only been two super outbreaks that have occurred in the U.S. since 1950. And the two years the super outbreaks occurred was 1974 and 2011 when they had seven and six. Well, in a super outbreak, what a super outbreak is classified as is if there's over 100 tornadoes that occur in a 24 hour period of time. Hmm. So in 1974, there was 148 tornadoes that occurred in a 24 hour period of time. Seven of them being F fives in 2011, there was 216 tornadoes that occurred in a 24 hour period of time. Four of them were F fives. So the other two F fives that occurred in 2011 actually happened a month later. So I think it was like in April when this super outburst or, uh, or outbreak happened, but in May is when like two more occurred as one-offs. But since 2013, we have not had an F5 tornado. You just jinxed it. You know, so we are currently sitting literally in the second to longest uh, drought since we've had an F5 tornado that we've had since 1950. The longest drought was an eight-year period between 1999 and 2007. Hmm. Would Al Gore say this is related to global warming? I don't know. Or would he just talk about the lockbox? <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of talking to the, my wife about this because I was researching it the other night and talking to her about like what I was learning and stuff. And she's like, so I would assume that there's more F5 tornadoes now than there used to be uh, because of global warming. And I was like, well... Ironically, actually, we haven't had an F5 since 2013. It's the second to longest drought. And she's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But what's considered the largest tornado in history was the last F5 that occurred. Mm. And that was one that happened in 2013. Um, that hit, I'm trying to remember, is, oh, it was it Oklahoma. El Reno, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. And that was actually one of the documentaries. So for people who don't, I mean, if this is your first time listening or, or whatever, I, we put our sources in in the show notes. So you should be able to go there and see like any documentaries that we've watched, any articles we've read, any books or anything like that. So if you're more interested, you can dig into that and actually get the sources that, that we use to get all this information. Um, but yeah, it was, it was an interesting documentary. It scared the crap out of me. It made me never want to freaking be in next to a F five tornado or anything like that. So, but yeah, that, that tornado, that last one, was uh, the one that I said was the largest one. Uh, its width, like the width that it was at its largest, mm. was 2.6 miles wide. Dang. And it yeah, ended up killing three different storm chasers um, that like knew what they were doing. But I don't care who you... Look, what? It's an F5 tornado. I'm not chasing anything. I'm running away from it. <laughs> <laughs> So, but yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much of my crash course, as Tracy says. <laughs> All right. Well, on my tornadoes. I don't think we left a stone <laughs> unturned. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on to uh, what Alan's question was uh, or is. Um, and luckily we have his, uh, some notes and then Danny, of course, prepared some as well. But uh, that would be. What are spider's webs made out of? Let's check it out. Did you hear that? What the hell just happened? What was that? You jumped off the sign and landed on your face. Shoot me 
What's wrong with my web shooters? Rapid fire is the default for enhanced combat mode. Why would I need rapid fire? Would you like to see more options? You have 576 possible web shooters. Well, apparently that's it. <laughs> I think there was more, but I touched my phone and it is done now. So we need Alan back. Yep, yeah. I am not a uh, the techie. production quality between <laughs> between Trav and I has really taken a hit. <laughs> it's gonna just be super crackly, and uh, I'm not gonna lie. Like I'm over here, I I kind of see why Alan just zones out a lot of the times when we're on the podcast because <laughs> I'm over here staring at the the recording bar or whatever. And yeah, I'm just like, all I'm doing is like, well, where's my voice measuring at this exact mo? Oh, I got to maintain this exact <laughs> volume or else it's going to clip. And if I go any quieter, then you won't hear me. So it's very technical. Well, what does it mean if I've also zoned out and I'm not doing any of the That production? just means that... <laughs> You're not in you, mid-season form. You heard a lot about <laughs> tornadoes. <laughs> yes, I did. And are about to hear a lot about <laughs> spider, spider webs. webs. So, uh, well, this was not my main topic, so I don't think I will have as much to uh, talk about on spider webs, unless you guys have a lot of internal no. spider web no- knowledge that I don't know about. I ha- I, I hate like spiders yeah. so much. Yeah, I don't like that. Them. I would not do research on them. <laughs> it, they freak me out. They <laughs> super gross. So no, what do you, what do you got? So the question that Alan had literally was what are spider webs made out of? I, I can tell you that they're made out of proteins, uh, AKA amino acids. So they're basically, how would you explain that Tracy? You're more of a doctor than I am. Um, <laughs> I thought it was spider poop. So, <laughs> excuse me, fecal matter. <laughs> Thank you for using the scientific term. Speaking of, okay, we're going to get away from this for just a little bit. Speaking of fecal matter, my profession <laughs> is uh, human resources. And uh, so, part of that is reviewing some background checks and things like that for any of the new employees that we're interested in looking at. I do uh, work for a construction company. And uh, so I had a, a manager reach out to me and say, hey, I'm interested in this guy. Let's run a background check. Got it, boss. Run it. And, uh, you know, I asked, I said, did he, you know, did you ask him if he had anything? Is there anything we should look out for? He goes, well, he said that he did have uh, a felony um, a few years ago, did not want to go into it. <laughs> That's always a great sign. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I actually, I turned it in, a, I don't run it by just going on like some third party website or anything. We actually have an in-house counsel. So uh, I sent it to him. He gets back to me, sends me this email and he goes, this is what I found. And it was something like back like March 31st. 2017, defendant walks into Walmart in this city, goes to a certain aisle, and just defecates all over the place, then grabs some items and leaves without paying. (laughs) (laughs) So what was the charge for? The pooping or the stealing? Well, there was theft. There was theft, which was about... I think they said it was five hundred and ninety-one dollars. And but public then defecation. You, but then when you add the amount of <laughs> this dude, I don't even know. Like he must have had diarrhea or something because yeah, I don't know. I this is super super gross. But because they said <laughs> the amount of damage caused by the fecal matter was about five hundred bucks. Wow. <laughs> so projectile. It must have been. <laughs> And so I just sent back. Like how many boxes of cereal did he have to poop on to get to 500 bucks? So I, well, I have no clue. I had a situation once though, a few years back where I was like at the grocery store and just, you know how like sometimes it just hits you. And when it hits you, you're just like, that's it. I got to go. Dan, that happened two weeks ago when we were in <laughs> Disneyland. Oh yeah. We don't mm-hmm. need to talk about that. Okay. That one's too fresh. Oh, okay. Just kidding. But yeah, that was a similar situation. But this one was like, literally, I was at this grocery store and I was like in the checkout line and I'm like, oh no. 
So I'm like, I literally know I have about 30 seconds of abdominal strength. (laughs) Abdominal Abdominal strength. Abdominal. (laughs) I have about 30 seconds of abdominal strength. (laughs) I have about 30 seconds worth of abdominal strength that I can use to hold this in before Ish is coming out. And so it was like, I mean, you're embarrassed kind of, you don't really know what to do, but the, it's more embarrassing to poop in line. <laughs> so I real, I like literally just took my car and I ran to like one of the bag boys and I was like, can you watch my stuff? I have to go to the bathroom. And I like just booked it. And I was like, I don't even care. Like if I come back and all my groceries are gone, I'll reshop. It's fine. But yeah, like I just had a run and it was not pleasant for the next 20 minutes. I have a feeling though that this this was not this guy's intention. It's almost as if like his plan was, I'm going to go to Walmart, I'm going to poop on some stuff (laughs) and then I'm going to steal stuff. (laughs) And, uh, but I just sent an email back to the manager and I said, so I sent him the same email and I was like, yeah, I think we're going to pass on this guy. (laughs) But, uh. So yeah, spider webs. So <laughs> they are not they are not uh spider poop, as Tracy says. They are proteins slash amino acids. I looked into it a little bit and honestly I was hoping Alan would have prepared more and would have been able to give us more in depth as far as like the science or like actually how you would describe this in a more I don't like a scientific way. I just keep saying science, but (laughs) so that's what it is. Maybe at some point he can kind of like go into like a two minute description of what it is. If he knows any more than that, but instead, like I took it into a more exciting realm of like, okay, it doesn't really matter what it's made out of, but what if we were to look at spider webs and decide like how strong spider webs are? So, like, if you were to take a spider web, how strong do you think it is compared to steel? I don't. I know I can walk through it. <laughs> <laughs> so, fairly weak is yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I could, I could break it. <laughs> You can you can almost just blow on it yeah. and they'll fall apart. It still, it's, it makes me feel icky. Uh, it's it's I, more sticky than I, anything. I don't like when it hits my face, but I also don't like when still hits my face. Either. But uh, yeah. Have you ever noticed that, like, when you do walk into a spider web, even if it's like, like, I mean, typically you don't walk into an entire spider web, but you'll walk into like a strand, right? Oh yeah, that you never saw coming. But then you freaking can't get it off. <laughs> you just stand there, just pulling at your face like yeah, a there's, dumb there's like egg. nothing there. <laughs> what? There's You're something. Like, I can feel it. I know it. I can feel it. But yeah, anyway. So if you were to take spider web, uh, like the average spider web, and you were to make it the same weight as the steel that you were measuring it against, it's actually five times stronger than steel and or two times stronger than Kevlar of the same weight. Mm. So it's actually like an insanely tough material. It's just that the spiders, when they when they poop, as Tracy says, it's just super, super thin, right? Super stringy. So that's why you can walk through it. But if there's rebar, like thickness and density of steel, but it was spider web, so really screwed. <laughs> if it were to be... You know, like if the scale was correct, when Spider Man shoots his webs at people, it should just literally go right through them. Just like penetrate. Yeah. <laughs> just yes and no. Murder. Because it was interesting because, like, I see all these articles out there and they're like, Spider Web is five times stronger than steel, two times stronger than Kevlar. But then there's like another subset of articles that's like, Spider web is not really stronger than steel. So I'm like, well, which one's correct? So I had to read all the articles and I'll post these articles in the show notes for anyone who wants to see them. But yeah, if you dig down to it a little deeper, it's just saying, cause it's by weight. So if you took the density of steel and you created spider web, that was that dense, then yes, it would be five times stronger, but spider web's not that dense. It's a lot lighter. So if you were to just take it and make it the same, like width, as steel, but kept the density um, as it currently is. 
<laughs> I didn't. Yeah, I'm trying to explain this using my hands, and I just kind of made it awkward for Trav. <laughs> but, like, yeah, then it's actually about this. It's, like, a little less strong than still. Um, but it could actually be used for, like, aerodynamics. So if they could still figure out a way to make spider silk, uh, even in the same density that it is now, they could use it in like carbon fiber and make airplanes because it's lightweight, but it's super strong. Hmm. So there are applications that could be used in the future if they could figure out how to make spider silk, man-made spider silk. There's a bark spider. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Darwin bark spider. No, it's just the all spiders are... <laughs> <laughs> But apparently this kind of spider can create like the most uh, tough spider silk and it would be equivalent to being like 10 times stronger than, uh, than, or is it, yeah, 10 times stronger than Kevlar. So I guess if you do the same like ratio, it would be 25 str- times stronger than steel. So is this something that like, I mean, you're saying that it would be interesting if we could, you know, figure this type of stuff out. Is this something that in, in whatever research you saw or you read through, that it is something that they're looking at doing? Well, I'm glad you asked, Trav. That's a very interesting question. I do, have an, I do have an answer for you, Thank you. on that. <laughs> so, yeah, it is. It's something that, I, I mean, I didn't know this, but I guess people for many, many years have been kind of obsessed with spider silk and how its properties and how it is so strong and have been trying to create man-made versions or synthetic versions of spider silk. And they've run into a couple of problems. One, because spider silk is literally made out of amino acids or proteins that are programmed by the DNA within the spider, it makes it very complicated to reproduce uh, a synthetic version of this because you're basically having to like reproduce something that life is creating, that DNA is programming, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So it's not easy to do. Two, anybody who's been able to kind of pull it off, there's they the way they do it, they just there's no way for them to create it and scale it. So maybe they can create a little bit of it, but they can't create a whole ton of it that would be used for like commercial use, right? Because you would need a lot of it. Why don't we spend a lot more time figuring this out and a lot less time trying to figure out how to colonize Mars? <laughs> Tra- Nobody wants to go there. <laughs> Trav's very afraid. If anyone missed that that episode, he he doesn't want cancer. I don't. Is one of his. Apparently, main. if you go to Mars, you get cancer. So I don't. <laughs> I don't want to go to Mars. <laughs> that seems fair. <laughs> but yet we are stuck on trying to figure out how to live on Mars. Well, there there are plenty of people working on this spider silk issue, and we're we're from Utah. Actually, Utah State University had some researchers that tried to figure this out um, a few years ago. And do you know what their answer was to it? Ain't gonna happen. (laughs) Close. (laughs) They decided to create what they called spider goats. Spider goats. So what they were doing is they were trying to genetically modify goats. No! So that when they would produce their milk... Their milk would have the additional proteins that spiders have in their spider silk, and somehow they would be able, they were thinking we can get their milk and then use the milk to spin it into man made spider silk. Hmm. It wasn't very successful. <laughs> I imagine not. <laughs> but I don't, I mean, do you remember that at all? I, I vaguely remember reports coming out or seeing it in the newspaper. I don't know where I, I saw it, but like anything about something spider about goats. spider goats. But I really think at the time that I was like, I must have assumed that I was looking at like a national Enquirer or something like that. Yeah. Cause I was like, probably like this can't be legit, but I probably ended up seeing it in like the Salt Lake Tribune. It's probably something like Mormons try to make spider goats. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that obviously wasn't very successful. There's been other attempts. None of them, like I said, have been super successful until recently in Cambridge. Cambridge is that in England. Yeah. Cambridge University, some researchers there figured out a way that they could take, uh, they could create spider silk using 98% water. So it's super green and super eco friendly. But what they do is they create this 
thing that they call hydrogel. And in this hydrogel, it's 98% water and it's 2% silica and cellulose. And then they put in these things called cucurbitarils. (laughs) (laughs) What? Interesting. Which are (laughs) cucurbitarils. Which are apparently molecules that serve as handcuffs that hold the silica and the cellulose together. They then pull out the strands. After 30 seconds, the water dehydrates. They're left with spider silk. But I think, again, this is just not scalable. It just, it's not something they can do right now that they can make a whole ton of it. Like From the video that I saw, like they made one string. So I don't think it's good for them. You know. <laughs> So yes, we're on our way to becoming (laughs) spider people. So to answer your question, they're trying, they can actually kind of replicate it, but they can't do it in any way that would massively be able to change how we as humans live. So yeah, well, Peter Parker figured it out pretty quick. So how come we can't just collect all the spiders we don't want in our homes and just have them make webs and collect those? Just pull out the webs one by one, <laughs> and then just weave them together yeah. to make one giant them together. freaking rope. A spider web rope. Yeah. So they have like silk farms and they have the silkworms, right? That are right. like the doing that. And they've tried creating spider uh, farms to do the same thing. That would be the scariest farm ever. <laughs> But the problem that they're running into is, I think it's like a space thing. Because like you could put a whole bunch of silkworms in a small area and they could just sit there and spin their silk, right? But if you put even just a few spiders in a small area, they're cannibalistic. They kill each other. Hmm. So it's not like economically feasible to create a farm with enough spiders in it in a small space that can create enough silk. So that's the problem that they run into with that. But then there's like one final note that might help. So instead of us worrying so much about the spider silk thing, recently they found something else. Because up until this point, spider silk was known as like the toughest material known in nature. Mm -hmm. Well, they found out that there's this sea snail called the limpet sea snail that lives in the ocean. And its teeth have actually proven to be even tougher than spider silk. It's like from what they can uh, or see right now, it's 10% stronger than spider silk. And it's actually kind of a fabric y type pattern that is within their teeth that actually is very uh, replicable. Is that the right word? Reclable? <laughs> <laughs> Reproducible? Replicate is the word? Yeah, replicable. <laughs> <laughs> replicable <laughs> yeah. what Trav said um, and they think they could actually create it using 3D printers like they can get they can copy the pattern I'm and just, trying to, just like these kids they like find this snail in the sea and they're like well I'll be damned well somebody come over here and look at his teeth I bet you this is stronger than spider silk <laughs> His teeth are stronger. It's definitely like a hillbilly <laughs> that finds this this snail in the he, in the it sea. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, like, if to just have an example of how tough their teeth are, it's they have the um, they can withstand a force equivalent to that of a spaghetti noodle, a dry spaghetti noodle, holding. 3,300 one pound bags of sugar and not snapping. Ooh. So, like, that's how tough these limpet, snail limpet teeth, teeth are. Yeah. Teeth. So, who knows? Before we have spider silk, maybe we'll be able to just print limpet teeth <laughs> in bulk. <laughs> well, and, here's hoping our uh, tax dollars are going to something good. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, yeah, if you, uh, have any comments or anything that we got wrong or anything? In it's that very segment. possible. Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> the vocabulary has been wrong. Feel free to uh, let us know uh, on one of our social media platforms. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to our third question here, um, which is: Are well, are there real life superheroes? And Trav, what the hell is that? Oh, no. <laughs> 
Now that was a crime, you purse scrubbing pukes. And this is uh, the penalty. Two minutes for slashing, two minutes for hooking, and lest I forget my personal favorite, two minutes for high stick. So great. In fact, when we were uh, getting that sound clip ready, all we wanted to do was watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Trav and I had a long discussion on like the fact that the first Ninja Turtles movie was by far the best Ninja Turtles movie. And Trav let me into a little secret. He let me know that in the second Ninja Turtles movie, I never knew this, and I've seen it a million times, that the Ninja Turtles never actually use their weapons. It's ridiculous. Not once. Think about it, folks. Michelangelo, the only time you see his actual nunchucks are when they're on the table when that like that pizza delivery boy comes into the apartment. And then the other time he uses something that looks like nunchucks, it's actually sausages. Um, Raphael never pulls out his size. And I think Leo uses his swords once to throw him into the ceiling and hold on to them and lift himself up off the ground while two bad guys run into each other. So, and Donnie, I think he maybe pulls out his, that sounds, I was going to say, he's gonna, he pulls out his staff like once. <laughs> he pulls out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, seriously, if you haven't figured that out, I mean, if you haven't realized that, go and watch it and you will be sorely disappointed after that because, all that's left is just Vanilla Ice singing Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go. But um, I wanted to talk about superheroes. I mean, right now, it's kind of the end of an era. Uh, Avengers Endgame just happened. Did you guys see it? I did. No. Tracy. <laughs> did you see anything? Did you see any of the previous movies to it? I think I did. All right. <sighs> Wait, so like of the 22 movies, how many have you seen? There's 22 of them? Not 22 Avengers. There's 22 like Marvel. It's 23 oh. actually, but. Well, is Ant-Man one? Yes. Yeah. Is um, that Ryan Reynolds? <laughs> Deadpool. <laughs> no. Deadpool, no. Oh. Well, although, then, shoot. I guess although it, it is, in the, now, it it is, is in the same universe, by. but. Oh. Well, it was owned by Fox, but Fox just sold the rights to Disney. So Disney technically could bring it in. But from what I've heard, Disney is just going to keep it kind of separate for now because they want to keep it R-rated. And yeah. They can't yeah, make that the doesn't Avengers seem like, R-rated. Yeah, the yeah. Disney brand. But anyway, for, apart from the early Batman and Superman movies um, that came out in the 80s and 90s, superhero culture has basically been a part of our lives since the release of Spider-Man in 2002, the Tobey Maguire one. I mean, X-Men actually came out in the year 2000, but uh, the... The superhero craze didn't get jump started until until Spider Man came out. Then, what about Superman? I feel like that was really big, and that was before that. That's DC. Oh. Well, no, but oh. it doesn't matter. I'm just I'm talking superheroes, and uh, I mean because Batman and Superman. Yeah, but uh, um, Superman. Are you, you're talking about the newer ones, or no, the, the, the original ones yeah. that came out. Like, well, yeah, in the 1978, 1980. That wasn't yeah. big back then. Well, they were, but they. They weren't as big as what superhero culture is now. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, because those were born of, you know, like all the all the comics that started earlier, earlier on. But then there was just like a like just nothing about superheroes for a while. Uh, in fact, that's the reason why Marvel got rid of the rights to Super or Spider Man because they almost went bankrupt. Nobody was buying their comics anymore. Nobody was interested in any of the superhero storylines, movies, or anything like that. And so uh, Marvel sold the rights of Spider-Man to Sony, yeah. who made the movies and did really well for the first two, and then just started falling apart until eventually they were able to come to an agreement. So Sony still actually owns Spider-Man, but uh, they're in an agreement with Marvel to, to keep him in the movies. Same thing goes with, like, uh, they sold the rights to X-Men to Fox, and, uh, and the same thing. Although the X-Men franchise is doing a little bit better than, than the Spider-Man one did. But anyway. Well, actually, now but Fox no longer owns it. Well, Disney they, owns. Well, they did they sell X-Men. it back. Okay, yeah. So Disney just made a huge deal with Fox. That just, How long ago was that? Because I like a month ago. Oh, okay. So and <laughs> it's now, very recent. Now Disney owns all of the rights that Fox had uh, 
so which was X Men, the Fantastic Four is it Fantastic Four? Is mm-hmm. that what they're called? Um, and yeah, like Deadpool and, and I don't know whatever else they own. So yeah. So in fact, since two thousand two, there have been sixty three superhero films to note. And that's mostly just like your DC and Marvel stuff. So that doesn't include any of the off-brand superhero movies such as like Kick-Ass, Hancock, Chronicle, even Hellboy. Um, All of those. I mean, there's like countless movies that have happened since the year 2000. So what Um, are they, if they don't classify Hellboy, I mean, do they consider him not a superhero because he's not like, he's from No, they do. It's just, it was an IMDb list that, that I was looking at and they didn't list that. But so oh. I went to a different list and had all those other ones there. So, but, uh, so I, basically my point being is, is just too many account. I mean, it's probably a hundred last 100 19, plus. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so the feeling of, you know, being super and having, you know, superpowers to help others is something that I think all of us have felt at one point in time, probably still daydream about it from time to time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, who wouldn't want to fly or, or have super strength? I know you like to identify yourself with uh, Superman. You call yourself Super Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's identified myself as are- Superman because <laughs> it's just more or less like I am Superman. And so every time that I see a kid like wearing a Superman shirt, I just like say, hey man, nice shirt. Thanks for the royalties. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> That's me. That's me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I mean, like, for example, uh, back when I was, I think I was in, I was like eighth grade, I believe, went on a trip to Las Vegas and uh, Disneyland. And while in Las Vegas, we were going into the New York, New York, uh, hotel and casino and they have a magic shop in there and this guy was out front and he had a card and he was making the card float he's swinging around him and everything and it's like all right for the for the low price of 25 dollars we will teach you how to do this so i'm like take my money I want to learn how to float a card. Because saying this is like a superhero move. In I'm just mind. saying in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, in no way did I think that there was any strings attached, pun intended. Because I'm thinking I'm literally going to learn how to float stuff. <laughs> it's totally I'm, worth 25 bucks. 25 bucks to learn how to move things with my mind. You kidding me? So I go and I buy it. And then uh, they take they take like a group of us. Because there were about six very gullible children that just spent $25 a piece on this little pack that had one card in it, a little ball of wax, and some string. And you fray the string, like, to the point to it's like, I mean, we're talking about... Uh, spider web. Spider webs. Like, about <laughs> that size. Like, you can't see it. And you attach it to a little tiny thing of wax, and then you tape it to the back of your ear. And then you just are able to kind of float the card. I was like, this is bull crap. <laughs> this is so stupid. But wait, you tape the string. So to you the take, back of your you ear? take one side of the string to the back of your ear and then you bring it out in front of you and you're holding it over your, like between your thumb and your index finger. And then as it's draping, you have the other end of the string attached to a little tiny, tiny ball of wax that is stuck to the card. So, which, you know, gives it its appearance of floating. And then when somebody wants to look at the card, you take your thumb and quickly just scrape off the the wax and hand it to them. Uh. And you still have the string attached. So then when they hand it back, you put it back on, float again. So really, you pay $25 for a card, some string, and wax. That's literally, yes, that's what I just said. (laughs) 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 So... (laughs) But okay, so back to everything, uh, having superpowers. So while that would be cool, and as far as I know, I mean, unless you guys know anything different, you're in the medical field. Superpowers, do they exist? <laughs> Probably not. But, uh, you know, there are definitely people who can exhibit extraordinary skills and abilities, like contortionists, which I think if that was a superpower, would be, this is the grossest 
uh, superpower ever because they just always look so gross when they, they put their contortionist. Hands. Yeah, but uh, but their, just things their like their that. Superpowers only really useful at like halftime shows. Is yeah. that what you're saying? I'm just saying people can do things that you wouldn't think could be possible, but I wouldn't classify that as a superpower. Is what I'm saying. So with that, you know, although there are no, there's nobody with actual real superpowers that doesn't stop people from putting on masks, putting on capes and outfits and going out into the world, into their cities and towns and patrolling and fighting crime. So this is the part that I was excited to hear about is, does this happen? And if so, where? So... All around, honestly, like all around the world, there are there's probably somebody in every city. I know that they're at some point in time. Um, now, it was a lot more, probably about uh, five years ago. Uh, I think it was a little bit more of a, uh, a, a, I guess, a larger movement of people who are coming out and and in superhero costumes and walking the streets and trying to help people and things like that. I think it's died down since, um, probably because they realized that, Oh, Hey, I don't even, you know, I put on a mask. Doesn't mean they can't shoot me. <laughs> so, but, uh, but there are still, yeah, there's plenty of people. There was a group of, uh, we'll put in air quotes, superheroes that, uh, walk the streets of Salt Lake city. And, uh, they, one of them, his name was nihilist. Mm. And uh, he is a tattoo artist by day and uh, would just don this this mask and hood. And and uh, he he called themselves horror heroes because him and his, his posse would wear like creepy clown masks and things like that. So they were like scarier type people, but they were still like trying to do good. So but, like really if I was somebody who was – being attacked by a robber, I might just like elect to just be like, you know what, you can just keep robbing me. <laughs> I'd rather not deal with the freaky clown posse over here. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But uh, there is actually a, uh, a website, and it's called reallifesuperheroes.com. And that was a uh, essentially a forum to where all these people from around... Uh, I think it was more generated uh, here in the States, but they could basically submit their superhero character and give a profile about themselves and they could be inducted to this real life superhero project. And uh, they would be put on this website and you could read about them, read what they're doing and uh, you could support them by probably like, I don't know, donating and things like that to their cause. Um, I'm going to tell you, most of these people, what they do is essentially just walk around and, and uh, a lot of them have, the fact that they just go and help the homeless. I mean, that's like what they have in common. Uh, if they're not, I mean, going out and fighting somebody, they're trying to help the homeless by giving them toothbrushes and <laughs> and things like that. So I feel like you can do that without so putting on a mask. Really, but, they're uh, just like charitable events. Baby, or basically, yeah. So Will you dress like Superman for the homeless, part? and they do it in the middle of the night. Um, probably, if Great. I get called Kalel. <laughs> So dumb. <laughs> so go to this website now, and this is why I say that I don't think that uh, this superhero movement has really made a lot of waves recently. Because when you go onto this website, really the last uh, I think update or or post was made in like 2013. Oh yeah. So I think they've all gone into hiding. <laughs> so. But uh, it's like that time between uh, The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises where Batman is just not seen. He goes into hiding. So maybe they'll come back out. But when you go to this website, you can see thing, You can see like all of their profiles. And I'm not going to go over all of them. I'll just go over a few of them that I, that I read. So uh, there's Mr. Extreme, who mm. is basically... Uh, you know, dressed in SWAT gear and ski goggles, and he patrols the streets of San Diego helping the homeless. I don't have actually a picture of him, oh. but well, I've seen him. <laughs> I just put the information on my notes. Uh, um, there's Nix. Nix is actually one of the few female superheroes uh, that are out there, 
and uh, she every be- female is a superhero. Trope. Well, yes, but not those that uh, walk the streets of uh, North Northern Jersey and uh, New York fighting crime. But she's been doing this since she was sixteen, so I don't know why. Like, I'd be well, freaked out, honestly. <clears throat> like <laughs> on there, so they they excuse me, <clears throat> they have superpowers. Or they they're superheroes, but do they claim that they have any superpowers? No, or no, it's it. So most they, of it is just doing charity. But they just put on the costume and they go out there. It's more of a symbol. So like, if you're out there and you're you know in trouble and you see them walking, you can feel comfortable enough to call them out and say, "Hey, come and help me. I need some help." It's yeah. I think they just do it so that they're recognizable. Are they donning costumes or donning? Donning, yes. Donning costumes. Yes, <laughs> they they do have costumes. Oh. Um, <clears throat> there's a guy named Motormouth who patrols the Bay Area in San Francisco and has encountered domestic violence situations and street thugs. Mm. I think I've met him. <laughs> he dresses as a bush. <laughs> I've seen that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Likes to scare people. Yes. He does. <laughs> Wait, there's really a guy that dresses as a bush? Yeah. Yeah, everybody knows him. It's Bushman. Um, there's the Crimson Fist. Now, the Crimson Fist, he overcame substance abuse and then afterwards decided to help others. By uh, taking away their drugs? Pretty much. Uh, but he, one night, uh, because, and, and just so you know, most of these people don't just go out on their own. Like there is a group of people and uh, there's usually in each city, there's like some type of um, society that they join uh, in order to go out. And then they all split up and they go in like pairs or in threes and they go and patrol the streets. I'm sure the cops don't really care for them much, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so the crimson fist one night uh, on his first patrol, he encountered two men attacking another in an alley. And uh, so he did not hesitate to act, and he approached them. And when they saw him, they ran away, and he prevailed. Oh, so success. He stood there, <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at them. He probably said, hey, and then they just ran because they probably thought he was a cop at first. But uh, honestly, though, if I if, if a dude dressed in superhero costume came up and confronted me when I was trying to do something wrong, I think I would be just like, you know, if they have the like the ability just to come out in public in these full costumes, I really cannot predict what they're going to do. Yeah. Like they're probably a high probability that they'll just they're crazy. Well, most of them have equipped themselves with protection gear so they have like batons uh tasers uh pepper spray just things like that so isn't they, a baton like the thing that people throw and like the girls and well that is one high baton. school or whatever this is a baton like a police baton they the retractable ones that they beat people with that are, oh <laughs> is that what they're called where they kind of like come out like a the yep. sticks, lightsaber yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so there's that. So there's also others that are outside. I told you. That, I mean, there's they're all over the world. There's in England. Um, they're in fact in Moscow and China has their own Batman. Uh, in China, that Batman's name is Chai Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make that up. <laughs> and. Basically, I mean, his his origin story of how he started doing that, I guess there was, uh, for whatever area he lived in, um, not too long ago, there was a, a, an earthquake, and everybody was kind of down on their luck and, and just super depressed and things. And so he um, donned a Batman suit and just went out on his bat cycle that he, that he custom made, and he just goes through town to town, through the city, just waving at people and taking pictures. So he doesn't do anything else. He doesn't go out throughout the night. He just goes during the day and he's more just like a celebrity yeah. character than yep. an actual superhero. Yep. But the Moscow Batman. Wait, there's another Batman? Yeah. So Moscow has one and China has one. The Moscow Batman, he's not like called Moss Batman. He's just Batman. But he does his research and finds drug dens 
and goes in and just beats the hell out of everybody in there. <laughs> oh my gosh. But he has not been seen for a few years, so I'm sure he's come to his senses like, okay, yeah, this is super dangerous. Well, is he <laughs> gone? Is he... I don't know. I don't he know. rest in peace? It didn't sound like that in the article that I read, but uh, it sounded like he probably just came to his senses, but he could also be dead. You don't know. Or he's like, there's a lot of money in this drug stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But there's one last guy that I want to talk about. And because if there is any of them, and he is actually not a part of this uh, superhero uh, project, the real life superhero project that I was talking about. This guy, pretty much, he has a, he has a sweet origin story as far as like superheroes go. But... His name is Phoenix Jones, and he patrols the streets of Seattle. Wait, <laughs> why? <laughs> you would think you would patrol the s- streets of Phoenix, but his name is Phoenix Jones. Phoenix and Jones. He, so does is there like a no Seattle <laughs> Sam who patrols the streets <laughs> so of the, dumb. <laughs> in Phoenix? Phoenix could be something else. It is um, also a like mythical a bird, creature, a bird that comes out of the ashes. Yes. Okay. So, and his story is, uh, one night he was walking out to his car and his car had been recently broken into. He didn't know it until he got there, but it was him and his son and they got out and he noticed that, I mean, his windows were all bashed out and his son, um, had tripped and cut up his knee and it was like gushing tons of blood. And so he got that taken care of, obviously, like his son was fine, but he couldn't, you know, he, he didn't feel good about telling his son that it was safe to go outside because he just couldn't tell him the truth. Like he didn't know. So he decided, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. So he quit his job and his job, he was an MMA fighter. So he quit that. And I guess he was like on his way to stardom when he quit. And he put this costume on, it's bulletproof, it's stab, I guess knife proof or whatever. And, uh, he just went out and started patrolling the city and he would stop criminals. Like he chased down like these car thieves and stopped the stabbing and uh, uh, a few other things. And the story goes that, and there's actual footage of this, which I saw, but he, there was like this brawl that was going on. <laughs> you see him walking and he's got this big old can of pepper spray and he's just going in and squirting everybody. <laughs> And uh, the the main guy's girlfriend, who is, I guess, who started the fight, she got pissed and started, like, chasing Phoenix Jones with her shoes. She's, like, <laughs> trying to hit him. And uh, he ended up getting arrested for that. Phoenix Jones did. For being a vigilante. For being a vigilante and using excessive pepper spray. <laughs> <laughs> so while he was in there, they told him that they were going, that he had to either hang it up or that they were going to reveal his secret identity or his true identity. And uh, so he decided to get out ahead of them and called a press conference. And there's video footage of this, obviously. And he just pulls off his mask and he's like, it's me. I'm (laughs) Phoenix Jones. And (laughs) his name is Benjamin John Francis Fodor. I'd never heard of him, but like I said, he, I mean, unless you're really into the MMA community, you probably wouldn't know him. But uh, that's he. He has since gone back to fighting, and uh, but uh, just not fighting crime. But not fighting crime. I mean, he he may still do it from you know every once in a while. But uh, yeah, just the the and it was Sports Center that actually did a piece on him, so you could find it on YouTube. I think so, he but. is fighting crime again, but he's just under the alias Denver Dan. Oh, I don't know. You never know. Did you? <laughs> Could be like Santa Fe Sally. You're so stupid. <laughs> but anyway, so I think really and truly what it comes down to is just a bunch of people who want to do something, but they also have fun. Um, they also have fun dressing up and going out and, and fighting crime, essentially. So, uh, you know, it was really interesting reading up on these guys, but... That's basically all I have. Any questions before we move on? Well, um, just, oh, go ahead, Trey. I thought you were going to take this topic in a little bit different way. So you guys might find this interesting. 
Have you guys heard of uh, synesthesia? Is that, a, is that a disease? A person? <laughs> a gas? A city? <laughs> so, so this is real humans. This can happen to. But um, it's where your senses kind of blend. So, like, for example, you would, every time you see the letter F, you see it in yellow. Or every time you hear this piano note, you see a color or a hue of a color. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's what it's called. But I I feel like that's kind of like a superhero thing where like you can, you hear certain things and you taste something when you hear it. I, right? It's like I a blending a, of senses. I knew a kid once that might have had that then because he came to me and he's like, yo, like when I... I make music <laughs> and when I make music, I make it because I see colors. So I don't see notes. Mm-hmm. I see colors and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, like literally like when I'm writing a song, I'll be like red, red, blue, green. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. And so, and then after it was all said, he's like, yeah, so do you want some acid? It's <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh, that explains it. <laughs> so. so the acid induced this for him. <laughs> yep. But no, people can do really cool things. Like uh, I saw this video. I think he he was uh, autistic, if I remember right. But he went to Italy, and they just had him in a helicopter for 30 minutes flying above. And if anybody's ever been there, there's tons of buildings, right? And they all, they all kind of look the same. Um, then there's some that definitely stick out, like the Coliseum and stuff. But he had 30 minutes in the helicopter, went back to the studio, had this huge kind of panoramic like paper setup thing. And for the day, sketched out the city that he saw, and they compared it to the actual city, and he had it right, like an unknown building, the number of windows he had exactly right, and things like that. Hmm. So, this is probably why I don't get into superheroes, because I think the real deal is pretty cool. Like, what people can actually do. Is cooler than... Than these, like, tights, guys in tights and masks and... (laughs) It's not all tights. The Iron Man mm. has like iron. He has tight pants. They're not pants. It's a Wonder suit. Woman's cool though. It's a suit. Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, that's all we have for you today. Really so, quick, Trav. Just nope. Do you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, will you have something that you could post, like videos and stuff? Like, because for me, I would. I think it would be interesting to see videos. Like you said, there was videos of that Phoenix Jones out there. Yes. Yeah, I could at least uh, get the link, and and and, and maybe we could put it in the show notes in, or something. Yeah. Okay. Why so. don't you want my video I referenced? Did you have a video you referenced? Yeah, I just told the story. I didn't know it was a video. I oh, just yeah. thought it was a story. A YouTube video, guys. <laughs> so yeah, we would like that. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, but yeah, I think that wraps up our three questions for this week. Join us next week. Uh, we're gonna have one mystery question. We're not sure what it's going to be yet, and neither do you. But we are also going to cover things like, well, not things like, but we will cover what is the Fermi paradox and which TV shows had disappointing endings, which, in my opinion, all of them. But Trav says you there's can, some good if ones. If you can out guess there. whose topic is which, <laughs> <laughs> which one is mine and which one is Daniel's. But uh, <laughs> that's that's the mystery for the week. But why don't you take us out, Trav? All right. Well, thanks again, guys, for listening in. Be sure to catch us on uh, and subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, and we are also on YouTube. But uh, also make sure to uh, rate us a good rating because Danny will cry if you do not. By rating good, we mean five stars. Five, five star rating. I'm okay with any rating, really. It just means somebody <laughs> listened. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, five star rating, and then uh, follow us on all of our social medias, so Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at QCO Podcast. So, and thanks. if you like what you hear, please tell your friends and family to uh, subscribe 
and, and and share our podcast with them because really sharing is caring. And you can visit our website at QCodePodcast.com and be sure to comment on anything. And if you have any questions or any ideas for upcoming episodes, please let us know and we will be happy to look at that and contemplate whether that would be something we, we would want to actually dive into. So, but thanks again, guys, for listening and we will see you next time. Thank you.